Hi, I'm Kim McIntosh and I teach biology at Shadow Mountain High School. And now we're going to move past Mendel's theories and his experiments and we're going to talk about um, DNA and RNA and actually how they are made up and what exactly their function is and how they do that function in the cells. So DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid, and so it's um, a nucleic acid. We've talked about that before, but the structure of it is it is made up of a sugar phosphate backbone. So you'll see here, this molecule should look familiar to you. This is the sugar, and here you see the phosphate over here to the side and that is on either side of that familiar DNA um, double helix that you're used to seeing but this is considered the backbone so this is on both sides and it basically helps maintain the structure of DNA and then inside here you see um, these nucleic acids or these base pairs as they're called. Now, so this one here, the T is for thymine and the A is for adenine. We have C for uh, cytosine and G for guanine. And we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail. But let's talk about the discovery first. Um, several scientists have studied DNA and they led to the discovery of DNA. So Griffith, Avery, Hershey, and Chase they all did experiments and they were trying to figure out exactly where the heredity was in the cells. And they're the ones that figured out that it had to be within the nucleus and it had to be within the actual um, chemistry of the DNA molecule. Now as far as that shape, that beautiful double helix that we're used to seeing, Watson and Crick were credited with the discovery, um, but they depended a lot on Rosalind Franklin's experiments. And Rosalind Franklin, she took pictures, so she did some x-ray pictures, and this is how they figured out that it had to have that double helix shape. Okay, so they looked at these pictures, but they also knew the chemistry of how these molecules were um, connected together. And this led us to figuring out the base pairing rules because the, um, you know, we looked at that sugar phosphate backbone and how the base pairs are in the middle. But you'll notice here that T is always paired with A, and this one has A with T. But still, those two molecules are always together. And then we can look here and see that C and G are together. And this is a rule. This is a base pairing rule. So A always pairs with T. And C always pairs with G. And the reason for that is because of the way the molecules are shaped. So here you see adenine and thymine, and you see how the, there is this polarity right here. So you have a positive and negative charge right there. That's going to cause the molecule to connect right there. And here you have a negative and a positive, and that's going to cause that molecule to connect right there. Okay, so right here is where adenine and thymine are going to bond together. And here, with guanine and cytosine, you'll see that there's three places that it's going to bond together, okay? So guanine cannot bond with adenine because there's not those three places for it to connect together. And the charges wouldn't be in the right order on adenine. And cytosine cannot connect with thymine. Guanine can't connect with thymine. So Adenine and thymine are always going to bond together. Guanine and cytosine are always going to bond together. It's a rule and it actually helps us a lot in figuring out these base pair sequences because if we have a strand of DNA, so here we have this strand right here and it goes G, A, A, C, A, T we know what that complementary base pair has to be. We know what that other strand has to be. 
there's no other option because of those base pair rules. We know that G is always going to pair with C. We know A is always going to pair with T, A with T, C with G, A with T, and T with A. And so we can always figure out what that complementary strand is going to be because we know the base pair rules. And this is um, pretty helpful with DNA replication because the way the molecule replicates, let me get a different color here, the, what happens is this enzyme called helicase, it comes in and it basically just unzips the DNA strand. So a lot of times this image is going to look just like a zipper. This helicase is coming in here and it's unzipping the strand. And the, that has to happen before the DNA can be replicated. And so then we have this strand and we have this strand. So we have basically we have a template over here and we have a template over here. And DNA polymerase comes in. That's another enzyme. DNA polymerase comes in and it basically just reads the st strand just like you or I would. It reads it and it says, okay, here's an A, we got to put a T with it. Here's a G, we got to put a C with it. Here's a T, we got to put an A with it. And it's doing that on this other strand as well. DNA polymerase comes in here and it's going to read the strand. Now, notice that it's reading it this way on this strand and it's reading it in this direction on this strand. But Basically, same situation, it's just reading it and it's saying, all right, we have an A, we have to put a T with it, we have a C, we're going to put a G there, we have a T, we need an A there. It reads the strand and it's going to put the complementary base pair in there and, and what we'll have at the end is we'll have a copy of the DNA. Now let's talk about RNA. Now RNA is a little bit different from DNA. For one thing, RNA is a single strand. It's not a double strand. So RNA is a single strand. But what RNA, the way RNA is created is the DNA unzips and an RNA strand is created based on that DNA strand. And when RNA is created, it's, um, it follows the same rules. The only thing different is that if it comes across an A, it's not going to put a T in there. It's not going to put thiamine in there in the RNA, but it's going to put uracil. And we indicate uracil with a U, okay? So it will come in and we will have this RNA strand that's created, it reads the DNA. So the DNA is, is the starting place for the instructions, but the RNA is created off of that. And so we'll get this strand. And so this one is C, G, A, G, C, G, A, G, and in this picture here, it doesn't actually show um, a U, but if it reads a T on the DNA strand, it's going to put a U in the RNA. And so that's a really good indication if you have RNA or DNA when you're looking at the code. If the code has a U in it, then it's RNA. And the RNA's job is basically to create a protein. So after that strand of RNA is generated from the DNA, then it's going to create a protein. And it does that by translating that strand. We call it translating codons. A codon is a, a section of three. So we figured out that that the um, when it's when the RNA is translated, it's translated in segments of three base pairs at a time. Okay, so when we have a, a strand of code like this, we break it into segments of three letters, and these three letters are called codons. Okay, and then to figure out what 
protein is going to be made from this, what we do is we look at this chart and we look at the first letter. So we come over here to the left, the first letter is C. The second letter is G, we come up to the top for the G. And the third letter is A. And so we'll come over here to the third letter, C and G put us here. We look for A and we have ARG, and this is not pirate speak, but that's actually um, arginine. So then the second one would be UAG, and so we would first go to the U, and then we're looking at UAG right here, and then we would go to the A, and then we would find G. So we have U, A, G is going to be a stop codon. So that tells us that's the end of where that protein is going to be made. So that's a stop codon. This reading this um, little chart right here, it's a lot like reading a multiplication table. So you start over on the side, you go to the top, come down, and then you'll find um, exactly what protein is going to be made from that um, strand of RNA.